I want to welcome you to this special video presentation for Christmas Eve 2021 from Grace Evangelical Lutheran Church in Oswego, New York. My name is Roy Terry. Since 2015, I've been filling the pulpit at Grace, and since 2016, I've been the church's presiding minister. Now, this is our second Christmas Eve service to be presented in this way as a result of COVID, and I, like you, hope and pray that it will be the last. I miss being able to meet in person on this special night worship. I, I miss taking part in its traditions. I miss seeing so many who come, often from far away, just for that time together. In a special way, Christmas Eve at Grace is a particularly eloquent expression of the congregation's closeness and love. Now, as I've been preparing this video, I've asked several of our members to reflect on the service and what it means and has meant to them through the years. You'll be hearing from them from time to time during our presentation. One thing I've heard over and over again from them is how this service has long been a high point of the year for them and for their families. The aspects of the service that really uh, make me feel Christmas are the ones I think that started when I was a child and I would come into this quiet place and see all of these people that I knew. And we would sit and you would hear the beautiful music and the, the story of the baby Jesus. And we could hear it over and over again. I was obsessed as a child with the manger scene and the pieces and the participants of that story. And every time I hear that story, I can see those little plastic pieces of my mother's manger scenes that I played with for many, many years. Um, I also, it's the last part of the service when we turn out the lights and everybody is quiet and we sing Silent Night. Uh, that I think fills me with the kind of feeling that I, I feel Christmas is. There's peace, there's family around me, there's love in the air, and it just sends us away from here, ready to celebrate the baby's birth. By the way, Grace's former long-term pastor, Bruce Schrader, will be presiding as we celebrate communion, and he'll be singing in German, Silent Night, near the close of the service. The annual Christmas Eve service that Grace Lutheran treasures so much was not always like it is today. As recently as the 1970s, it lacked many of the features that have made it so special. Many of those were introduced by Pastor Bruce early in his long tenure with the congregation. I would say that in the beginning and when I first came, um, Christmas Eve was a service um, similar to a Sunday worship, only it was centered in Christmas. The building was lighted all the time, and um, I'm not sure if we had Holy Communion at that service or not. But as the years went on and I developed the service, um, when people came to worship that night, the altar area would be in darkness, the nave lights would be dim, the um, advent wreath would be lighted, and when we were ready to begin, I would walk in and go to the back and all of the lights would be put out. And then a reader from the balcony would begin reading the words from the Gospel of John. And as that person read, then someone bearing a candle, the Christ candle, would walk up the middle aisle. And as they were walking, there were acolytes on either side, and they would light the candles in the sconces as they came. And when 
the candle bearer got to the Christ, to the Advent wreath, he placed the candle and then put out the Advent candles with the, un, with the symbolism that the prophecy had been fulfilled. And that would begin the service. And we had lots of music. And in sting, instead of singing the Gloria, as usual, we sang Angels We Have Heard on High. And we, we substituted as much music as we could for parts of the service. And it was a, just a, a beautiful service. And I, I tried to have a, a special sermon, um, sometimes in poetry for the congregation. And um, that took it. And then when we came for communion, then the nave lights were off, they were lowered, and people could quietly come for communion. And when we came to the ending of the service, the acolytes came and um, went well, there were two from the front and two from the back, and they, they would meet in the middle and light the candles in the congregation, and then all of the lights would be off except the, the window lights, the lights on the altar, and the lights of the tree, and then we would sing Silent Night, a cappella, in the candlelight, and uh, people would be seated for safety, and then when we finished, I gave the benediction and the dismissal. The lights came on a little, and people left in the quiet. And I might mention that um, when the, the candle bearer put the candle in the, the wreath, and the acolytes had finished lighting the windows, then they would come and light the candles in the altar. They would light the candles in the windows, and the tree, and then turn on the nave or the altar light area lights, and we would begin. So it, it began from just a, a Christmas Eve service as you would on Sunday, and, and we ended with, I won't say a production, but it was a way of captivating and, and capturing the mystery and the wonder of the night. I, for one, look forward to the churches reinstating more of those beautiful practices Bruce mentioned. If you know much about Grace Lutheran in Oswego, you know that visible preparations for the church's celebration of Jesus' birth start at the beginning of the Advent season. It's then that decorations begin to appear around the building, among the first of them being the wreaths that are hung on the sanctuary walls and on the front doors of the church. They're purchased locally, but preparing them for display is the congregation's task. All available hands take part in putting them in their traditional spots, including on the church's front doors. Next comes the Christmas tree. For some years now, the tree and its ornaments have been the responsibility of the Carr and Connors families who meet in early December to cover it with special decorations called chrismons, a word meaning symbols of Christ, which are white and gold ornaments whose designs reflect themes tied to Christ. The tree's lights aren't turned on and many of the candles in the sanctuary aren't lit until the Christmas Eve service when they symbolize Christ's coming as light of the world. It was John Darling, I believe, that long ago always got the Christmas tree and on his truck and brought it here. Uh, we inherited the decorating from the Dowd family. So we tried to get together every year and we tried to bring an in-gathering gift and then the little kids, I give them a gift at the end. But it's a, a way to get my family together because it's very hard for us all to be in one place at the same time. and. So we continue the tradition of uh, doing the ornaments together. Uh, a lot of the Christmas, um, I believe, came out in the 70s for this church. And a lot of them are very old and fragile and broke. Uh, my sister incorporated, uh, she's very good at crocheting, and she incorporated a bulb that she crocheted around a gold ball. 
So we kept the gold and the, the white theme. Uh, we found a tri Christmas tree skirt that had the poinsettia with the gold uh, theme. And that was my mother's doing because everything had to be beautiful and pretty and just so. And uh, we, of course, in the church, when they did the uh, 12 days of Christmas, we have those to incorporate in the tree. And then uh, I did a little bit, since there is music, and uh, I do a lot of bows. All my, all my gifts have bows on them, and real bows, not the stick on. And so I found a ribbon that has like music uh, in scroll and uh, to put above. And of course, the crown always has to go at the top of the tree. Finally, the crash or manger scene is set up. We'll be giving thanks for it and asking God's blessing upon it in just a few minutes. Let us now gather for worship. Many ages from the time when God created the heavens and the earth and then formed man and woman in his own image, long after the great flood, when God made the rainbow shine forth as a sign of the covenant. 21 centuries from the time the promise was given to Abraham and Sarah, 13 centuries after Moses led the people of Israel out of Egypt and Miriam danced in freedom, 1100 years from the time of Ruth and the judges, 1000 years from the appointing of David as king in fulfillment of the times and years and months and days discerned by the prophets in the 194th Olympiad, the 752nd year from the foundation of the city of Rome, the 42nd year of the reign of Octavian Augustus. While the whole world enjoyed a span of peace, Jesus Christ, eternal God, Son of the Eternal Father, desiring to sanctify the world by his most merciful coming, being conceived by the Holy Spirit and nine months of growth in the womb of his mother, now in our own times, is the nativity of the Lord Jesus Christ, God made flesh. My family always says that every song and every hymn is my favorite because I love them. And I would sit down to practice at home and I would say, uh, just one more. I'm just going to play one more. And about an hour later, <laughs> I would still be playing. <laughs> Not that they complained. Uh, I do love all the hymns and carols. I, I, I would have to choose O Come All Ye Faithful. Um, I can't even express the thrill of playing that on Christmas Eve. It's pure joy. It, it is just pure joy. 
And, and I think that that hem is probably one of the reasons why I went into, the, into music. Um, I sang in a chorus in eighth grade, and we processed into the auditorium singing in Latin, Adeste Fidelis, and it was glorious. And I'll always remember that as being such a special moment, and it's remained special ever since. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. God of every nation and people, from the very beginning of creation, you have made manifest your love. When our need for a Savior was great, you sent your Son to be born of the Virgin Mary. To our lives, he brings joy and peace, justice, mercy, and love. Lord, bless all who look upon this manger. May it remind us of the humble birth of Jesus and raise our thoughts to him who is God with us and Savior of all and who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you made this holy night shine with the brightness of the true light. Grant that here on earth we may walk in the light of Jesus' presence and in the last day wake to the brightness of his glory. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading is from the ninth chapter of Isaiah, verses 2 through 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The word of the Lord. Our second reading is found in chapter 2 of Titus, verses 11 through 14. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all, training us to renounce impiety and worldly passions, and in the present age to live lives that are self-controlled, upright, and godly, while we wait for the blessed hope and the manifestation of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He it is who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify for himself a people of his own who are zealous for good deeds. The word of the Lord.
Our gospel reading this evening is from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. The Holy Gospel according to Luke. In those days a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver the child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in bands of cloth, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste, and found Mary and Joseph, and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told them. The Gospel of the Lord. True worship has been called a kind of liminal experience. What's meant by that is that true worship takes us into the region that is the boundary between the mundane and the extraordinary, the boundary between our fleshly existence and the transcendent existence of God, and it allows us to look at ourselves and at God in ways that would be otherwise inaccessible to us. One of the great values of a service like this one comes in its predictability, its sameness year after year, that makes it an ideal liminal experience. Because we do the same things, we sing the same carols, we hear the same texts of Scripture, we don't need to bother with adjusting to newness. We need only to pray again, to sing again, to listen again and to let the service take us to the boundary where we can see clearly and be changed. I'm sure that you've noticed that our primary gospel reading for Christmas Eve is always what we just read, Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. Now that makes sense. It's the only scripture passage that we have that deals with the events surrounding the night of Jesus' birth. 
But even if it weren't, it would still be a favorite, I think, and we'd read it every year. It's a beautiful story with beautiful imagery, and we can connect with it because it rings so true to us as it underscores just how unlikely and maybe chaotic the circumstances of Christ's birth must have seemed to everyone who was involved. You can see what I mean as we begin where I... You can see what I mean as we begin where Luke begins with the census. Luke describes it in very solemn terms with attention to its place in history. It happened, he tells us, at the order of Caesar Augustus when Quirinius was governor of Syria and it was empire-wide. Now the truth is we know nothing of this particular census from secular history. We do know of one later census in AD 6 and 7, but it was just local. This one is described as the first, so Luke probably knew of that other one. Still, the census itself is largely a mystery to us. We here in America have just completed a census of our own. We have it every decade for several good reasons. One of them is that it helps Congress fairly allot seats in the House of Representatives. This time again, because New York State is growing more slowly than states to the south and west of us, we stand to lose a couple of congresspersons in the end. The census also enables the federal government to distribute aid more fairly to the states. Finally, it gives us a clearer picture of ourselves as a people, who we are, how families are faring economically, how often we move, and the like. Well, Caesar Augustus would have called for a census for a different set of reasons. I'm pretty sure he ordered the census in our text, one, because he could, and two, because it served his and the empire's ends. A census could give him an idea of how much in taxes the empire could be expected to receive. That was an important piece of practical information for him. It could also give a clear, if indirect, message to his subjects regarding who was actually in charge of their lives and how easily he could exercise power over them. And that's, by the way, a very important, if unwelcome, piece of practical information for them. The first U.S. census that I remember was in 1960. There was a census taker who came to our house, and I recall my mother sitting in our living room with her and answering a long list of questions about our family. In the 2020 census, most of us received an invitation to participate, as it was called, in the mail that gave us instructions on how to complete an online questionnaire. A small number of persons received the same questionnaire on paper, and a very small number got an actual visit from someone, just as my mother did in 1960. This year, there weren't many questions for us to answer. Our census didn't require much of us, and it didn't take much time or effort for us to complete However, the particular census that Luke describes imposed a real hardship. It required everyone to go back to his or her hometown and enroll there. For Joseph and his betrothed Mary, this meant going from Nazareth in Galilee back to the village of Bethlehem down in Judea, and to do so at their own expense, because Joseph's ancestry led back to King David, and that was where King David's family had been from. It was quite a hike under the best of conditions, and the timing could not have been much worse than it was. Mary was, as the King James Version puts it, great with child, and the trip must have been very hard for her. The pictures of Mary and Joseph on the road to Bethlehem always show Mary on a donkey. Now, in case you hadn't already noticed it, there is no donkey in the text of Luke. Mary may have walked for the entire trip. Now, all of this was by Rome's intention, I believe. 
the trip was mandatory and the more difficult it was for Rome's subjects, the stronger its message of absolute control over their lives. From somewhere back in my childhood, I got the picture that Joseph and Mary were for just, from somewhere back in my childhood, I got the picture that Joseph and Mary were just required to go some, to, from somewhere back in my childhood, I got the picture that Joseph and Mary were just required to go to some Roman agent, give their names and addresses and the like, and leave. But that doesn't seem to have been the procedure. Luke gives us every indication that when the couple arrived in Bethlehem, they'd barely started the process of enrollment. They were required to be there for, at the very least, several days or weeks. And they weren't alone. The village was filled with uprooted people like themselves, and there were no vacancies. So staying in the inn wasn't an option. There was, however, a barn, or more likely a shed for livestock, that was available. It became their temporary home. Eventually, Matthew's gospel says that they found a house, but not by the time the events in our story occurred. Well, one night, while they were there waiting on Roman bureaucrats for what must have seemed like an eternity, Mary's child was born. It could not have been a more inopportune moment, but babies come when they're ready to come, and not a moment earlier and not a moment later. Mary wrapped him, her son Jesus, in swaddling cloths, probably just rags, and laid him in the only crib available, a feed trough, a manger. Outside the village, in the dark, there were some shepherds guarding a flock from thieves and predators, both animal and human. Now, despite the 23rd Psalm and what Jesus says about the good shepherd who would lay down his life for the sheep, theirs was not what we'd call a high status or high prestige occupation. No special skills were required, and the type of persons attracted to the work of shepherds gave shepherds as a class the reputation of being dishonest and irreligious. Be that as it may, one thing you and I can be certain of is what was on their minds. It was the same thing that might be on the mind of any night watchman, the hope that nothing at all would happen. A good night for a shepherd would indeed be a silent night. But then an angel appeared. Now, most of our artistic depictions of angels make them seem impressive in a positive way, you know, kind of warm and fuzzy. The classic pictures show them in white with beautiful wings, perfect complexions, and, of course, blonde hair. Suffice it to say, those classic pictures don't come out of the Bible. The angels of Scripture sometimes look just like us, and the Bible even mentions how some have entertained angels without being aware of it. But then, the angels of Scripture sometimes, in fact, it seems most of the time, don't look like us at all. And encountering one of those angels is never, shall I say, a comforting experience. In fact, it's downright terrifying, and the terrifying angelic appearance is usually compounded by an equally terrifying angelic message. The angel who appeared to the shepherds was one of the powerful, terrifying ones. But his, maybe I should say its, because angels are genderless, his first words to them were, Do not be afraid. For see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. And then he gave them the details. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And then the solitary angel was joined by a mighty angelic army, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace among those whom he favors. And then 
they were all gone. Now, I don't know what you do when you think you see something that doesn't match reality as you know it, but I know what I do. I usually, at least, count it up as maybe a dream or maybe a hallucination, but I keep quiet about it. But that's because I'm alone when it happens to me. These shepherds were together, and they'd all seen the angel, and they'd all heard his words, and they'd all seen and heard the angelic army. They knew that what they'd seen and heard was real, and they decided together to check it out for themselves. So hurriedly, they went into Bethlehem. I wonder what they did with the sheep when they did that, but, uh, but they went into Bethlehem, and sure enough, they found Mary and Joseph, and they found the baby swaddled just as the angel had described him. And they told their story, and everyone who heard it was amazed. My guess is that mainly because they were shepherds, not, as I said, a class of people with great with reputations for honesty and integrity, most of the people who might have heard them tell their story would have rationalized it or explained it away, and in the end wouldn't have thought all that much about it and there's no evidence that the shepherds reported it to anyone beyond the little circle mentioned by Luke anyway. But there was one person who paid a lot of attention to what happened that evening. That was Mary, and when the shepherds left the stall turned temporary home and returned to their flocks, praising God for all they'd seen and heard and for the fact that everything was just as the angel had described it, she treasured their words to her and pondered them in her heart. Tonight, like the people we read about in Luke's account, we find our lives largely controlled by factors and by people who use their power in ways that we can only submit to. And so, like Mary and Joseph, we often find ourselves pressed and compelled to do what we don't want to do. And yet, with them, we find God's purposes being worked out through even those events and situations. And we see his will, his hand at work through us, in us, and for us. Tonight, by our presence in this place, we celebrate with the shepherds the good news of the Savior, good news that has been proclaimed, surprise of surprises, even to us. And like the shepherds, together we seek him and finding him, we give God praise for the wonderful gift he has given us. And we rejoice that he has made himself known even to us, through a beautiful child who grew to become the man who would give his life for our redemption. Tonight, with the angelic army, we find our hearts filled with song, and in our hymns and carols we give glory to God and declare his peace with those whom he favors. And tonight, with Mary, we pause. And we ponder what God has done, and what the coming of the Messiah means and will mean for us and for all. May God bless each one of us at this special moment. May he fill us with a sense of his holiness, his grace, his presence, and especially his love. Amen.
Let us now say together what we believe in the ancient words, I believe in God, the Father, the Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Gathered with all who seek the Christ child, let us pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Wonderful counselor, on this holy night, your church throughout the world celebrates the word of God being born among us. Endow your church with a zeal for sharing your love and grace with all. Hear us, O God. Lord of hosts, the heavens are glad, the earth rejoices, and the trees sing for joy at your coming. Grant us wisdom to care for your creation in ways that benefit all of your creatures. Hear us, O God. Prince of Peace, your grace has appeared and brings salvation to all. Bring healing to the people and nations divided by violence. Direct the leaders of the nations so that in self-controlled, upright, and godly living, they may work toward peace. Hear us, O God. Mighty God of mercy, you come among us as a vulnerable infant. Protect all in need, those without homes or caregivers, those who grieve, all who are hungry, and all who are ill, especially those whom we name in our hearts. Hear us, O God. Gracious God, we praise you for gathering us tonight to worship in holy splendor. Direct our worship, fellowship, and service so that our lives and the Christian witness may be pleasing to you. Hear us, O God. Into your outstretched arms, O God, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in Jesus Christ, the light and life of the world. Amen. Even though we're physically separated, through the love of God and the power of his spirit, we are united by faith and fellowship and forgiveness. So let us now, as Christ's people, extend to one another the peace of Christ. The peace of Christ be with you always. Uh, many years ago, people said people were not having Christ in Christmas anymore. And I thought, well, Christ is always in Christmas. But I'll sort of make it my own way of symbolizing that. And I added another S to the, the, the um the word M-A-S, so it became Christ Mass. And I'm thinking that Christmas is the service of the Christ. And Mass in the ancient time of the church is a service of Holy Communion. We're celebrating the Lord's Supper. It is a Holy Eucharist. And with that, then also I bring in the words of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and lived among us. And that I see as that beginning, that background, that foundation upon which then, when Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood, and he gave us the opportunity to share in that festive 
and that meaningful meal where he gave himself in love for us and for the forgiveness of our sin. And I see Christmas as having that center when Jesus, as we celebrate, was born, that this was a babe anointed by God to come and live among God's people and bring the good news of the gospel to all people. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. <clears throat> it is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places Give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus the Christ. You comforted your people with the promise of the Redeemer, through whom you will also make all things new in the day when he comes to judge the world in righteousness. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. <clears throat> Holy One, the beginning and the end, the giver of life, blessed are you for the birth of creation. Blessed are you in the darkness and the light. Blessed are you for your promise to your people. Blessed are you in the prophet's hopes and dreams. Blessed are you for Mary's openness to your will. Blessed are you for your son Jesus, the Word made flesh. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks for the bread, and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. 
do this for the remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. With this bread and cup, we remember your word dwelling among us, full of grace and truth. We remember our own birth in his death and resurrection. We look for the hope for his coming. Holy God, we long for your spirit. Come among us. Bless this meal. May your word take flesh in us. Awaken your people. Fill us with your light. Bring the gift of peace on earth. Come, Holy Spirit. All praise and glory are yours, Holy One of Israel, Word of God incarnate, power of the Most High, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> The table is set, the meal is prepared. Come to the Christ banquet, feast on God's gift of grace. Carolyn, the body of the Christ given for you. the blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. If you will give me communion, please. Pastor Bruce, the body of Christ given for you blood of Christ shed for you. Thank you. The body of blood of our Lord Jesus the Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Most high God, you have come <laughs> among us at this table. 
by the Spirit's power, form us to be bearers of your word, sharing gifts of mercy and grace with all, through Jesus Christ, our host and our guest. Amen. Amen. The people who have walked in darkness have seen a great light. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was life. And the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Still and knocked, I lag and knocked, all is left in some walk. Nur das Trote hoch heilige Paar, holder Knabe im lachenden Haar, schlaf in himmlischer in him Thank you for joining us for this special Christmas Eve service. 
Although Grace Lutheran Church is not meeting in person on Christmas Eve, we will be assembling for worship at our regular time, 9.30 a.m. on Sunday, December 26th. Our service will include a special time for our singing of carols and hymns of the season, and we'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper as well. In case you were wondering, our members are vaccinated, are masked, and are careful to maintain social distancing. We do hope you can be with us. May God bless you in this season and always.